Hello everyone and welcome to the 31st installment of the Galen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. My name is Dwayne Mancini. I'm the CEO at Project MedTech. Today we'll be hearing from Jim Warren at Jable for a discussion on napkin to prototype to scale, an innovation and supply chain discussion. Uh, first, a few housekeeping slides and some information on Galen Data. Galen Data is an FDA compliant cloud for medical device manufacturers. The Galen Cloud provides a configurable platform for device to cloud connectivity that is compliant to FDA, HIPAA, and CE MARC standards. The company is ISO 13485 certified, and the product on AWS is High Trust certified as well. Founded by seasoned medical device professionals, the company's goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all at a fraction of the cost while shaving months off the development timeline. Galen Data allows medical device companies to stay medical device companies and not become IT companies. Um, some quick logistics. If you have any questions, so so sometimes on this, on this webinar we have um, uh, slides or or there's a formal presentation. In this case, it's gonna be uh, Jim and I just kind of having a conversation and going back and forth. And so if you have questions, um, please drop those in the question section on the right-hand side of your screen um, as you have them. And if they're they're relevant to where we're going, uh, maybe I'll save them, but, but if they're super pertinent to what we're talking about, I'll, I'll kind of pipe them in uh, then. Um, there is also on the right-hand side a handout section um, you can feel free to download those. There's a white paper on device connectivity that Galen had written, and there's also a uh, data sheet as well on, on, on Galen data. Um, so, uh, as a reminder, uh, you'll also receive a recording of this webinar via email. Uh, feel free to follow up should you have any additional questions. And, and something else that I don't normally highlight, but, but I was just talking to the Galen team and wanted to highlight this. Previous, all 30 of the other Galen Data Webinar series, or at least uh, most of them, are on the YouTube channel. So if there was something you've seen in the past that you wanted to go back and rewatch, or there was a piece of it, feel free to, to head over there and you can check it out there. Um, with that being said, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jim Warren. Uh, Jim joined uh, Jable in 1998 after graduating from the University of Florida with a finance and economics degree. Um, he started as a manager in training as part of Jable's Emerging Leaders Development Program. And during that time, he rotated through cross-functional positions and in operations, inventory control, supply chain planning, work cell management, design, quality, and, and um, uh, business development. And so uh, without further ado, uh, Jim, welcome to the Galen Data Webinar Series. Thanks, Dwayne. Appreciate y'all having me today. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So, so Jim, let's. I, I gave a brief intro, but but let's talk about uh, your background and, and and how you got to Jable, and, and I guess you know, who is Jable? What does Jable do? Sure, absolutely. So the first thing I like to tell people, people hear Jable, <clears throat> I like to explain it's just James and Bill. You kind of push them together, and you get a J Bill. Uh, and when I I was growing up, they actually built their corporate headquarters across from where I was uh, where I was a kid, and so I got to watch that growth. And uh, when I came back from university, I had a job sign, uh, set up in in finance uh, overseas, and they were having a job fair at Jable, and I had to go find out. Uh, at the time, uh, I was calling it Job Bill, so I got to learn something that day that it was in fact Jable. And I learned all about it and got a shot, and um, it, it, it never looked back. So it's uh, August will be almost 25 years there. So uh, it's been exciting. Um, one of the greatest uh, companies that I've that I've ever been involved with, and I can say that uh, I've seen a lot of other companies, the outside looking in, and have come and told us that that we're we're just a great company. We have a, a great culture, and really what we do is. <clears throat> we allow companies to focus on uh, their R&D and their marketing and their sales, and we handle all that pesky manufacturing stuff. And uh, I think the cool thing about contract manufacturing is that diversification that that our team has done such a great job with. It, it does allow us, when one industry's down, another one's up, and it balances out. But you can really imagine if you're a company and, and your sales are up and down, and sometimes your line's running, sometimes it's not. Well, you got to pay. You can't just let those people go and then bring them back the next day. And so I think that contract manufacturing, it's really found its way 
um, into the business plans of all companies at, at some level. And um, certainly I think medical has almost been a holdout because of, of just the level of control that medical companies like to have. And I also think that they, they've, they've finally come around to see that, yeah, we, we, can, we can leverage someone like a Jable. So now we're the largest manufacturer of medical devices in the world. Um, and that's just been a few years post acquisition in Nipro, which is a fantastic company that's, that's helped us learn a lot about medical. Uh, and then moving forward, you know, we're, we're looking more in the minimally invasive devices. We're looking into robotics. Uh, those are big things that, that we see the future. And, um, and the neat thing is when, when you're at Jable and you have all this other knowledge from other industries, being able to uh, adopt um, those factors into medical, it's, it's pretty neat. So it's been fun and it continues to be fun. And, and right now, I personally, I head up uh, the aesthetics technology space. So that's where I'm, I'm focused on aesthetics. Uh, and helping a lot of those companies in the medical side of aesthetics come around to to um, uh, a leaner model and being able to push that manufacturing to Jable. Very cool. Um, so when we talked before this, uh, we talked about, hey, you know, what are some of the various topics we kind of want to cover here when we're thinking about going from back of a na back of a napkin all the way through, you know, supply chain? And and one of the first things we talked about was just design, right? Um, so maybe let's start there with design. What are the key processes? What should we be thinking about at that stage? Um, and then we'll go from there. Sure. I, I think it, what's funny to me is <clears throat> I look back at there's a, for me, I, I started off in the consumer side um, in Jable and see a lot of startups come through and, and those ideas, uh, you can kick off an idea and have it in production within six weeks. Very different on the medical side. So I think Really, you, you got to establish your financial case for what is the treatment modality you're going after and is the market there. And, and regulatory is a huge part. I know there's some great partners out there for regulatory uh, like Proxima. Um, they do a fantastic job of helping you figure out if your business case is actually going to come to fruition. So I think I, I think what's more important than than really coming up with the concept is or the conceptual design is the business case that's around it. And does it support the investment that you're going to be looking for because it's it's quite large as we know in the medical space um, so I, I think a lot of people get excited about an idea and I want people to stay excited about ideas but I, I think it's important to do the due diligence and, and find out if what you're going after is ultimately going to be an investment that people want to make and, and will your device be able to scale in a manner that allows it to pay back that investment timeline um, so there's a lot of things to consider um, there's a lot of good ideas, and, and a lot of times when I'm dealing with customers, and we do a thing called customer value mapping at Jable, where we look at other industries and think about how we could take something that we see somewhere else and apply it to medical. There's tons of those ideas, um, but the, the 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 bridge from idea to execution, and then ultimately to scale, that's where all the work has to be done. Uh, so I think there's a lot of good ideas out there, but is it a business case that that's going to stand up its own company or allow for an opportunity where you're you're bought out? I think those are the big questions that that start off early on. Um, but in medical, the most important thing is is how fast can you get it into the hands of the doctors and and allow the treatment of the patient if it is a really good idea. Um, Jim, one question uh, that 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 I have because I, I so I've done a podcast episode on this of a company that took um, software validation they were doing in the aerospace industry and they moved into device and you just kind of brought that up a little bit and, you know something um, we we always talk to entrepreneurs in the med tech space and tell them you know how nuanced the industry is, right? Why it's so important to have so much with the industry. But maybe tell me from like the manufacturing side, what are some of those other adjacent industries where, you know, obviously med tech is nuanced, but what are some of those things that are maybe applicable uh, and where do they pull from besides maybe the aerospace or aerospace could be one? Sure. So the way Jable's broken up is we have our EMS and our DMS divisions. So diversified manufacturing, <clears throat> which is our medical, military, uh, then we start looking in the consumer side, telecom, white goods, automotive, um, all those spaces, they're, they're using adjacent technologies. <clears throat> I think the big part in medical is you start looking at that validation of that technology and uh, the process and rigor that's associated with it, where 
you know, you, you wouldn't want to be in an implantables uh, running off of a, a consumer quality guideline. You would want to have a tighter tolerance around the expectations of manufacturing and such. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you're still using the same electronic components in a lot of cases. So, and it's a lot of the same processes and procedures. So that IQOQ, PQ validation process that you go through that allows you to to generate that rigor that's that's ultimately written in your 510k submission and, and proves that your device is going to be regulated and it's going to come out the same way each time. I think that's a that's a significant amount of rigor that exists in the in the um, the industry as a whole. But really, the medical side takes it up a notch, especially when you start dealing with the FDA side audits and so on. You want to make sure that your documentation is rock solid around what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, and and so what else on the design side? And and I'm not being rude. I just have a list of notes here on my tablet. Sure. Um, what what else on 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 that design side? So so we have a maybe that that sketch on our napkin. You kind of talked about you know yeah, is there even a market for this? Is there a financial story? Which those are two separate things um, that we we generally like to highlight. Right there is there's there's always for the most part, generally speaking, the market market size is not the problem. It's it's um, are you truly solving an unmet clinical need? Is there an economic story behind it? If you if you aren't something new to the market, um, what are other some of those? What, what are some other things within that design process that should be taken taken into account at beyond those two? I think we learned about this in the last couple of years, but supply chain is huge. Um, I know that that's one of the parts that we're talking about today, but your device is only as good and, and your opportunity is only as good as if you're going to be able to meet that demand. And I think that's a huge part of the supply chain that we learned about in, in the last couple of years is just how fragile our supply chain is. So I think simplicity is important. Um, a lot of times, you know, my, my background's in finance and economics, right? So engineering, I've kind of learned as I've, as I've, I've traveled through Jable. Um, but one thing I've seen is time to time, we, we hear people talk about something being over-engineered. And a lot of times that is somebody that, that, that is taking all of their training and really trying to apply it at the same time. And then you'll meet engineers who are I would say been, been in the industry longer, and they're looking for elegant solutions, simple solutions, ways that minimize the amount of parts on a board, and it's almost a minimalist effort. And I think that's probably one of the most important things is you, you achieve a treatment modality. What's the simplest way of achieving that, that treatment modality? How, did, how can you do that with the least number of parts, the least complexity of manufacturing, now I'm not saying you you want to get it down to there's no buttons on the device. I'm not I'm not talking about like appleizing something, but you want to get it to the point where your supply chain can stand on its own, regardless of whether you're in a COVID environment or if you're in a 2008 environment. You want to have something that that's elegant and simplistic. And I think achieving that the lowest common denominator for treatment and modality, that should be where your aim your aim is. A lot of times I've seen devices that are just just they're they're built like a tank, but they they're over engineered, and unfortunately, it defeats the opportunity for scale, and it defeats the opportunity for automation. Yeah. Um, so so Jim, that's a great segue, right? Because we we had four major things we wanted to talk about. It was just sort of design, supply chain, manufacturing, and uh, QMS integration. And so let's let's kind of dive into that supply chain aspect of things. Um, you, you kind of brought it up there, but but same same question as as we did to kick off the design piece. What does this process look like? You know, what what are we need to know the key processes of what we should be considering when we get to the supply chain aspect of this? And I think as a quick asterisk to all this, everyone will start to see the, the, these four things are so interrelated, um, and they're very hard to think of. Literally, I guess, right? Right? Like, it's not just you do this, then you go to this step, then you go to this step, then you go to this step. I, I think it's a little more um, interactive than just that. So, so let's 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 hear about supply chain. Sure. So, I, one of the things, one of the tests I give people. So, Jable's heavily involved in MedTech Innovator, and we meet a lot of companies that that are just starting up, and they have their bill of materials and their ABL. 
a test that I like to see them take is the DigiKey test. So how much of that bill of materials, that AVL is readily available on DigiKey? And I don't just mean, can I find the part on DigiKey, but can I find it in a quantity that supports my next two years? Is it available right now? Um, when it's not, it's an easy question to ask why. Why have I picked something that is, uh, that is not available, readily available? Is there a way to, to walk back to that? Um, we deal with a, a lot of design engineers in our company who will initially see an ASIC on a board and that ASIC will maybe need 10% of that power for the application that this is being used for. And you, you can question why it ends up on the board and so on. A lot of times it has to do with uh, engagements with engineers who are very comfortable with that component or it can do everything and it's expandability in the future. But we're, we're really not talking about that right now. We're talking about how do we get this product project and product off the ground and we do it in the simplest nature. So if you can't find some of these parts or the lead time is 26 weeks or, or upwards, a lot of times you want to break down your process for that, that ASIC into what is it really? And is it just three microprocessors, a diode, a crystal is really what you need? And if so, you apply that to the board. Um, the neat thing about medical in some cases, not all cases, is that there is a lot of real estate on the, the PCBA. Um, and so ultimately you can go back and make some changes or you can leave areas open for expansion in the future. Um, but I do think that sometimes we, it's easy for us to just to pick the largest horsepower chip and throw that on the board and then you know, we'll figure out how to max out its use later on. But really you're tying yourself into, sometimes it, it, we've seen it upwards of, of uh, I, I always say 26 week lead time. I've seen some that are much, much farther out, um, but 26 is, is pretty scary. Um, in my world, anything over eight to 10 weeks is scary. And I say that because demand changes, laws change, regulatory changes, a new customer can come in and take up a spot that, that maybe you thought you had that area locked down and now you've got a significant inventory exposure. The neat thing about a part that's an eight to 10 week lead time, generally that's used by a lot of people. That's why it's so readily available. So now you're not stuck with a boatload of inventory because you made a design change in order to catch up or, 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 or achieve a keep out on your design. So, and I don't say, I wouldn't say that there are special parts out there that, that um, aren't necessary. There are going to be some that you're going to have to deal with, but the less you have, um, then there, that's the less chance of you tying up capital in something that uh, you're not going to be able to get rid of that's ultimately going to drag your, your project down or over push your CapEx and so on. Yeah, Jim, I'd like to call out a couple things here. Yeah, at Project MedTech, we deal exclusively with startup companies. And so um, this, um, uh, inventory piece is is a very hot subject for us, right? Um, for a couple different reasons, especially the the, the turnaround time of supply chain. Um, one, for companies who are just getting to market, nothing would be nothing would hurt worse than to get a reoccurring sales or reoccurring orders from a single customer, specifically a, a hospital system, and then have to tell them, "Hey, we're on back order." Right. And they're our only client or our first client or whatever it is. But, but that could be detrimental for an early stage company. And then the cash flow piece is huge. And, and this is a big piece of it, especially when startups are still raising a finite amount of money and maybe don't have revenue. This could be a really tricky situation in terms of how much inventory to keep. What's the turnaround time? What's that do to our cash flow? Knowing that we might not get cash from a hospital system for 90 days, right? Who knows what those terms are? Who knows when they're going to pay us? And so there's a lot there that I just wanted to call out downstream from, from kind of what you had, had brought up. The other piece was PCBA. Is that printed circuit board assembly? You got it. Sorry. Okay. And what, <laughs> no, no, you're all good. I, I may, uh, this is, this is my, I'm a stickler for um, uh, abbreviations until just to make sure everyone knows them because there are so many in the industry. The other one you used was AVL, approved vendor list. Yep, got it. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, um, okay. So, so in terms of the supply chain, uh, you, you talked about a lot right there. What's your what's your like biggest error that you see companies make in this space? Uh, I would say picking a supplier that is not available on someone like DigiKey. So, I, I mean, that's that's not saying that you won't find them. You'll, you'll have suppliers that pop up on DigiKey and their lead time is over 26 weeks. I get that. But 
what spooks me is when you know, I've spent 25 years in the supply chain industry, and when I hear a name that I don't recognize, it spooks me because it means that that's something boutique or bespoke or a lot of those things that are going to drive um, almost an immediate last time buy. You could, those are the ones that spook you when something changes. And one thing I will say, one thing I want to add on that that piece about supply chain and inventory, Dwayne, is your manufacturer, you're building a relationship with a manufacturer. A lot of inventory that goes into the manufacturer is going to come a point where you're going to bump up against your credit limit, meaning you've got product on the floor, you've got stuff that's inbound, you have payables, accounts receivable, um, then your inventory starts to build up. And these manufacturers will, will allow you to hold a certain amount of inventory there per contract. But when it starts to get over that, you're gonna have credit terms that are gonna come due where you're gonna to have to pay interest on that. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that, but one thing I think manufacturers are trying to avoid is, is becoming an investor in stealth where, yeah, we believe in you or we wouldn't have you in the program and we wouldn't be building for you, but also we don't wanna hold a hundred million dollars of, of inventory for free. That ties up our cash and, and we don't get any benefit off of that. And so I think it's something that manufacturers are, are looking at more and more is, What's that exposure going to be? So you're going to have inventory deposit discussions. You're going to have claims around your 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 payment terms. Um, how if you do miss your payments, what does that mean? What's the relationship? And I, and I think this is all just because we continue to see that interest rate going up. That impacts the manufacturer, and ultimately they they can't just set and and absorb that cost. So I think it is vital that we we continue to look at a lean supply chain and the right selection of components that are readily available. Easy to return, easy to cancel. Uh, that that NCNR, the non-cancelable, non-returnable. That's another one. When I see that on a bill of materials, it makes me nervous because I do know that that's going to be a special item that I'm going to be stuck with um, the, if if something changes on the design. Um, and that's that's kind of a watch out as well. Okay, awesome. Um, again, leading right into the the next topic, manufacturing. Um, what are the key processes to consider there? And, and I'm also curious to, especially like tying them back to design, right? Because you, you kind of brought that up of, of earlier with design of like not over doing it or over, what did you say, um, over building it or, or you know, engineering. Yeah. Muscles. yeah, over engineering. So, so tell me about you know, manufacturing the key process there, but then even more specifically that relationship with design. Sure. So I, there's there's things called design for manufacturing that you go through when you when you come up with an idea. <clears throat> and these are important steps because in order for your business to grow and your opportunity to get bigger, you have to scale. Scale is only allowed for something that's easy to produce. If, if we get into something that's boutique, meaning say I have to get a bunch of people together and we've got to use soldering irons and we've got to sit around the table to do this because we can't get a machine to do it. Obviously, that's a long-term impact on investment opportunity because you can't scale. So often what I what I say is you got to get involved with a manufacturer early. You got to bring your design to them. So whether you're looking at like an ERI group or a Rev1 or like a Best Circuits out of Florida, one of those folks that can take a look at your design and decide if it tell you where you're going down the right path, or is there an angle where maybe you, you could do something differently? Um, that's important early because especially in the medical space, when you lock into a design, you submit that 510K, you're kind of stuck with it. So you don't want to go back and have to do back writing. You don't want to have to change a lot, resubmit and so on. But also there's a lot that manufacturers know that, that, to be helpful in the space. And, and sometimes we joke that we've forgotten more than most people know about manufacturing because we've just seen it so many times. Um, there's an area called Valor Rules, for instance, when you're building a printed circuit board assembly where where, where are the parts located on the board? Where's the, where's the areas that you want to keep them away? Where's the area that you don't want to overpopulate? Things like that, I think, are, are pretty, pretty important. Um, and that's extremely, um, that's an area where you're not going to learn that by just running through YouTube videos. You're going to have to reach out to an expert. That's going to be extremely important. Yeah, um, I like that a lot. Um, I, I, I want to go to the common pitfalls um, uh, of this segment as well. And then I have another question to circle back to. So let's go with common pitfalls first. Sure. 
Yeah, I think I think common pitfalls is, is assuming it's going to be easier than you think. I think that's one of those things. It's it's there's a lot of intricacies in what we do in manufacturing and designing for tests, for instance. And a lot of people, why do I need ICT or, or in circuit test right away? Why can't I just use flying probe? That seems to be easier. Um, my functional test, my burn-in process, a lot of these things. I, I don't think. Uh, if you if you assume it's going to be easy, that's a big pitfall. Um, that's something that you need to have an expert involved in because they're going to teach you the little things. Same thing with supply chain, um, things that you're going to learn about early on that um, are going to be a challenge. Maybe you didn't recognize those. You thought it was going to be easy. Someone uh, someone told you they they saw or read something. And, you know, hey, supply chain's freeing back up. I think we're going to be good. So I think it, it, it's not asking the ep experts early. That's a huge pitfall. You've got to get that expert opinion early in order to make sure that what you're doing is going to continue to survive and move forward. Yeah, and, and so I, I want to circle back to the manufacturing piece where you kind of talked about, you know, being able, you know, once you do your 510K, you're kind of locked in, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, but something I want to ask about there, you know, specifically with 510K products, Right. So so by mm -hmm. definition, if you are a 510K product, you are substantially equivalent to something else on the market. I'm not saying there's not disruptors in the 510K space. There for sure are. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the majority are slightly better than whatever already on the market. Right. There is there is instances mm -hmm. where there is a 510K that is definitely a market disruptor. Maybe there they maybe it's they're taking technology that's being used on uh, in the brain and now they're going to use it for a valve. I, I don't know. Right. Right. But, but, but for the most part, they're, they're very similar. And so some area that we see a lot of people make mistakes on, and I'm not sure how to think about this come out in this space, but um, price at that point is super important um, mm -hmm. because you know, that's going to be one of the big reasons why a hospital is going to decide to say, hey, I will now purchase your product over this product. I, I doubt you're making that big of a difference that that's not going to play a pretty big factor in this. And so I'm curious, what are measures you can take at that design phase to, to keep in mind, like, like how much, if I design a really cool product and it's $80, but I need it to be 40. Mm -hmm. Is that realistic into the manufacturer? Factor? I mean, how do I put those safeguards in place as I'm designing? That's a confusing space for me. Well, I think when we go back to the business perspective, right? Where we talk about the, what is this device gonna do? How is it gonna become an investable object? And, and how are people gonna get behind it? Cost is always number one, right? So if I tell somebody, uh, you've got to pay ten dollars more. I think we've all we all hear the stories about hospitals where the hospitals are super tight on their budget line. <clears throat> They're always looking for cost reductions. So you either have to make a device that's cheaper, and like you said, when you go from eighty to forty, is that is that a significant reduction? Absolutely. Is it achievable? Really depends on what the eighty dollars starting point is, and exactly what have you done that that is driven it to eighty dollars, and how can you get it back to forty? But let's say you can't get it down to 40, and that's the current price that, that the hospital's paying for a device that does something similar. <clears throat> well, say yours is now at 50. What are you giving them for that extra $10? Is it the ease of, of um, uh, repeat orders where it's automatic refill and it's coming to them automatically? Um, is it something that reduce, greatly reduces their time and effort that they have to use in order to execute? <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that comes down to the marketing aspect of it is, do you really understand your product, your market, the people that are going to be using it, and how is that achievable? Um, for me, uh, that's not an area that I have to worry about, right? So I usually get that product and have to start manufacturing it. But what I can do is look at the cost reduction opportunities and areas that I can achieve a reduction. Um, and for me, that's, that's an area where we look at supply chain localization. We look at alternative components. Those are things that, again, aren't going to generally be the owner of the device is always going to look at quite readily. They're going to usually need a partner with it. Um, and then at least in manufacturing, there's economies of scale that allow for those reductions to become apparent. Um, now, those aren't always going to happen in the first two or three years of the product's life. That's going to have to be kind of a plan that's laid out where initially you're starting off with a thousand units a month and then you're going to move to 10 or 20,000 or so on. And you start achieving that scale is naturally going to draw down the price of the of the device in a lot of cases 
Um, but you want to you want to have a time horizon for that that you can you can show your investors how the price is going to go down over time, and that's going to that's going to allow for more hospitals to buy it. Um, I think that 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 is a, a tif- difficult picture to kind of draft up initially, but you you kind of want to band it. What's a great opportunity? Uh, best uh, best case scenario, worst case scenario. How do those line up, and what's kind of in the middle? I think a lot of that on the marketing side is extremely important early on to be able to do and align again with your supply chain ability to grow uh, localized contract manufacturing solutions for di- for different areas that you're going to build in. I think all that starts to pop up in, in, in those early discussions. Um, but again, it's about reaching out to experts that have that have been through that before and understand it. Um, again, I, I always come back to regulatory. <clears throat> That's a huge space that I think that's not something I ever assume I understand. So if I if I'm asked for regulatory advice, I just shake my head and you know push it to like a proxima because they're they're the experts in that space and they're going to be folks that are going to be able to guide you through that and give you um, uh, goals and objectives that are going to help guide guide your product through the life cycle. And I think that that's that's an area that again if you if you think you can go watch a couple of youtube videos and understand it you, you may get that surface level basic understanding of the acronyms but outside of that it is a murky space that you're going to need a lot of guidance to get through yeah no i i love that i also love the ties you made from marketing to like engineering and manufacturing um we did a whole episode actually on um the communication breakdown sometimes between marketing and and engineering at at, at companies, uh, especially at an early phase, but the importance of having both parties at the table. Um, And generally speaking, there's there's generally some differences between um, the two groups. And so anyways, I just, I I love that you're bringing up the importance of that because I think that is a key piece. Um, QMS integration. Um, So so this is a, uh, another big piece that, um, there's some tension sometimes, right? Of like, well, the design team doesn't want to feel constrained from the quality and, and the quality team is like, well, you have to do it underneath these guidelines, right? And there, there's that constant battle back and forth and tension. And when you think of a quality management system versus when you don't, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's timely, but, uh, we just released a, an episode of the podcast today with, uh, David Duram from Green Lake Guru. He's a CEO. And, and he talks about um, the difference between compliance and quality, right? And his point was no one goes to goes out on a date and goes to dinner and says, boy, the restaurant was compliant to uh, food regulations, right? They say, oh, it's good quality, right? And so that whole point is even as designers, you should be thinking that you want to make a good quality product. Um, but maybe walk me through some of just like the, the thought process behind QMS integration, when to consider it, how's it fit in, uh, strategy behind it, uh, kind of lay out the processes there. Sure. So I, th- th- these devices, I think what's important for us, and we all kind of admit this in the medical space versus consumer, that you know a consumer product doesn't work. You take it in, you get a new one. A medical device doesn't work that's a possibility for someone to die. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a heavy burden. Now, how do you make sure that your device is gonna work all the time? I think that's the quality management system. You're devising a QMS that allows for the critical points of your device to be tested and regulated inside of your manufacturer, it's extremely important. I, I think the quality, it starts off early as well. So when you look at a 510K submission and you think about the quality aspects of that, it has to follow all the way through. Your framework has to be there in the beginning. So as often as, as we talk about the importance of quality in a device, I think the, the importance is even more so that quality is part of the development cycle. Um, I often say that supply chain should be part of the development cycle as well, because if you, you want to get tied in too early to a bad idea in supply chain, you can't get away from it. I think the same can be said from quality. If you start a process where you're not doing ICT as opposed to flying probe at the end of your manufacturing line, and that's how you write your spec, and that's what you're going to go with. It's a lot of room for for opportunities of failure at that point that you're not going to identify early on. It's going to hurt you for scale. There's so much that quality does early on um, to identify areas of of um, critical manufacturing, and if you if you follow a good quality strategy early, it'll just make 
your life so much easier going forward. Now, how do you define a, a good quality strategy versus a bad one? So I think a, a bad one is one that's, that's rooted in subjectivity that's very loose. Uh, I think the best quality plans are objective and I think they, they're defined uh, at each step. How do you know that what you just did was the right thing and how can you verify it? What's the test for it? Um, I also think that a good quality strategy bases itself around statistical analysis and allows you to, to keep things at the forefront that could generate statistical variance, not anomalies. Uh, and that anomaly factor is something that we all deal with inside of manufacturing. Occasionally you have that one event that's outside of the upper or lower control limit and then everything comes back into play. Um, so having a good person, uh, a good quality engineer is going to be someone who really understands statistics and how to apply them. Um, and ultimately, the good thing the good thing about this is if you do this early on, you can achieve uh, statistical validation of your product, and that drives investment because people can see that what you're doing early on is subjective. It is defined around a solid QMS process. That takes a lot of the subjectivity and concern out of uh, out of the investors, and I think that that's huge for for a startup. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then I think the other thing too, uh, on the same page, if, if we're talking specifically about startups or early stage companies, um, your QMS plays a big role in your valuation at the end when you have an exit. And not in the sense that it like increases your valuation any, but it's one of those things where if you go in thinking your company should be valued at $100,000, or $100 million, my goodness, $100,000, you got problems, $100 million, um, you know, and, and, and not having a robust QMS, well, mm -hmm. that gives the strategic a, a reason to say, hey, you know what, maybe you're only 80, because we're going to have to do some, we're going to have to do some, some, some back end work here on the QMS. And so it's one of those things that, you know, you should just be doing, um, uh, one, to put out a good quality product, to, like, like you said, because people's lives depend on it. Um, but at the beginning, for investors, at the end, for strategic, you, you just got to be doing it. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. You have pitfalls with the QMS? Where, where, where are the biggest pitfalls you see? Yeah, uh, a big one is assuming QMS doesn't apply to your software. So I, I think that that's a huge yeah. one. And that's, that's an area that, as we, we see devices, when I talk about an elegant solution on a device, we're moving more towards a software solution than we are a hardware solution. Um, we have all sorts of sensing capabilities in these devices nowadays, which is great. But what's on the back side of that is the software aspect of it. Um, and in contract manufacturing, we, we don't deal with software. You send us the code, we load it, we, we build out, we test to make sure that the code was loaded properly, and then it ships. That is a that is a that is a spooky area for me because I don't understand software. My dad was a software architect for IBM, and and you know he he would understand all that stuff, but I don't. So I look at that and say, if that is that is that a pitfall? Absolutely. Um, you have to have an early setup for quality um, in in your software. So that that's a big one. I think when we look at manufacturing pitfalls, having a subjective process versus objective, that's a big pitfall. Um, being able to identify and lay out um, the history, the his history from a quality perspective of your device from inception all the way through clinicals and into production and how quality played a role in that. Not being able to do that, it's a huge pitfall. But again, software, it, it is a area that you're, you're going to have to understand it. And from a quality perspective, how do you control quality? How do you do user testing? Uh, how does it integrate with Android or iOS, depending on which route you go? Um, that is an area that you are going to need experts in. And I think even more so now when we start thinking about cloud computing, that's, that's, a, that's a big area and understanding HIPAA compliance and the regulatory side. So is your software regulatory? Is, it, is, it, is there a set plan for that? Those are areas that, again, you're going to have to involve the right people, whether it's Proxima, Galen. That's, those are those are folks that are going to well understand that space better than than, the, than your manufacturer, which is going to be vital. Because um, I can build all these products, but if they're not going to have the software to run, or run consistently, or or be regulated regulated properly, then you you you've got a big you've got a big problem right there. That's probably the biggest pitfall is not knowing what you don't know. And again, reaching out to experts is vital for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so so from the cloud and software side, I mean, Galen's obviously a perfect partner for that. Um, 
And, and actually, Galen has had uh, Isabella Schmidt from Proxima. Uh, she was last month's episode, or last month's guest, I believe. And then about a year prior to that, she was on with uh, a guy named uh, Karen Deep um, uh, Singh, I think is his last name. He's in the UK. He's an independent consultant, also kind of in the software space. Um, and, and they gave some really good discussions around validation and regulatory and quality. And so um, if that is, if that is, you are in that area, those, those are some resources to de definitely, you know, reach out to. Um, so Jim, you know, we talk about this, we talk about how integrated these things are. Obviously, there's a way for you to kind of piecemeal all of this, right? You could use different houses for different things, but based on the, how interconnected all these are, you could kind of see where the value is to have someone who could do this all under one roof. Um, obviously, J-Bill is, is, is one of those. Um, but I'm curious, you know, it, it, it does come up because, you know, we work with a lot of startups at Project MedTech and, um, you know, we'll go out and get quotes for stuff like this. And it, it reminds me of my clinical trial days, right, where uh, I worked at NAMPS, I worked at LabCorp. We would quote, quote clinical trials and companies would come back and say, you were a million dollars higher than you know, so-and-so, or, or you were this much off, and they would get like 10 quotes, they'd throw three away, or they'd throw seven of them away, they'd pick three, and they'd try to get them close together and figure out who's going to be the cheapest. And there's a lot of assumptions that are being made um, within clinical trials, and that's generally where the prices are. It's not that anyone's cheaper than the other, it's that they made an assumption, um, and, and in my experience, the cheapest one is always going to have change orders that come, right? And it's going to be the same price that the, the other one's quoted. I would imagine, and based on what I've seen, this is pretty similar here, right? If I go to a group and say, I need all of this quoted, I'm going to get some crazy, some, some, some different prices. So my question to you, and as unbiased as you could be, is, if, I, if I'm an early stage company or if I'm a company in general and I'm getting this quoted, how do I weed out um, some of the misquoted ones or how do I make sure we're all quoting on the same assumptions? I guess, what does that look, process look like? Well, I think it's, so it's important that you quote more than one or two, right? I, I, I would say you want to quote like five people. The reason being is you are going to get this spectrum of costs. And then what you have is once you have those five proposals, you boil them down from the most expensive to least expensive and find out, um, you know, imagine you're buying a car and you, you, you don't need a Rolls Royce, but you know, someone's going to quote you a Rolls Royce. That, that's generally what will happen. Now, someone's also going to someone's also going to quote you, a, say, a Toyota Camry. Does what does what you needs to do. And then you're going to get someone else who, wow, that their price is even lower than the Toyota Camry. Well. They're selling you a Toyota Camry, but it doesn't have the tires, the transmission, or the engine. You got to pay for that later. Why? Why do I have to pay for that later? Is this when I when I look at what my goal is for the proposal, what it is I'm planning to achieve? Am I getting that from the? Am I getting that out of that proposal or not? And if I'm getting more than I'm asking for, what's the benefit? Why do I need that? So I think you have to sit down and, and read through those and, and really understand what you're getting. Um, we've unfortunately had customers that have come to us before, and we've done our proposal. And then two years later, they're well above what we quoted and still not the pro still don't have the product that they expected. And that happens because there's, there's, there's I guess, the term we use nowadays is bad actors out there who are going to pull you in and they're going to get what they can out of you. Um, that's going to happen. And the best way to do that is to educate yourself. Reach out to your mentors in the industry. And this is really extremely important when we have groups like MedTech Innovator and, and relationships that you can involve with, with, um, with other startups, learn from their mistakes, learn from the battles that they've been through, have that mentor relationship where you can find out, here's what I'm asking for ahead of uh, a manufacturing plan or a clinical. Here's some expectations that I have for the work product. Is, am, am, am I being uh, too, too myopic or not myopic enough? Am, am I expecting too little or not enough? I think those are the things that you, you really have to dig in and find out um, the difference bef between those proposals. And then you align to the one that you think is, is the best for what you're driving to. Again, the other cool thing about, we talk about QMS is how do those proposals align to your QMS strategy? How are they gonna integrate with you and your team? 
both from a hardware and a software perspective. And it, it have those requirements written out ahead of time that align with your QMS and your team's expectations of success and also what the investors are looking for. Kind of have that, that, that North Star, if you will, and that's what guides those proposals, um, as well as how you receive them and understand them, and then go back and question. I think uh, well, Jabel has a thing called the five whys. We ask why five times. Yeah, it's annoying. It sounds like a three-year-old asking you know, a question over and over again. But man, do you, you gain something when you drill down to that level? You start to really understand if the person that is challenging you really understands what they're talking about. Um, and if they do, that, that fifth why, you're probably going to gain some insights you didn't have before. So don't, uh, don't think of it as a bad thing when you, when you go back and ask those, the, for those proposals when you dig deeper and want to understand more. Um, a big part of it is you, you, there's a lot of proposals that are out there that are being done. Are they being done by the senior executive at that firm? Probably not. They're probably being done with, with, with uh, answers that are preloaded, that come back. Um, so ask the question why and dig in and you'll find that alignment to a potential best case out of those five. But I, I would say five props is usually the way to go. Uh, you can really learn a lot from the feedback you get from those. Now, if they all come back at the same price, um, then it might be that you weren't refined enough in your request. Um, so making sure that you have a detailed request that, that aligns with your goals, with the company, the device and so and investors uh, is vital. Yeah, that's great feedback. Um, that was something I was going to ask, you know, is like the cost drive, understanding the cost drivers heading into that of, hey, if I'm going to give you, if, I, if I'm kind of not sure, you know, what are the five most important things to give? And so um, I like that you kind of brought that up because that is the biggest thing, right, is if, if you don't give them enough information to quote on, you're not going to get legitimate quotes. Um, so. We had a couple questions um, from the audience uh, uh, ahead of the event, and, and for anyone else who's, who's listening in, feel free if you have other questions to drop them in um, on the right hand side of your screen. Um, one of the questions, Jim, was what does the ideal partnership look like with a medical device founder? With a medical device founder. So would this be um, you're talking about the relationship between me and the medical device finder from a contract manufacturing perspective? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll be upfront as I tell a lot of people, Jabil last year, $33.5 billion in revenue. So it's a big company. Um, and with that, we carry a lot of uh, experience, uh, which often equates to a cost associated with manufacturing. So I think, first off, is it the right size of the relationship? Um, how does it fit in to uh, the level of detail and communication that you're going to need? Um, and culturally, that's a big thing. We've turned away partnerships with large, with large opportunities because culturally we weren't the right fit between our two companies. Um, I think with any relationship, that's important. You have to figure out, is it, is it going to be a, a good cultural fit? Uh, what you're there, will they deliver what you expect from them? Um, and it goes both ways. Um, when we're doing contract negotiations, we, we go through a process called turn the table, where if you were sitting on the other side and, and being asked for this, what would your reaction be? Um, and sometimes uh, I think if you've, if you've done it enough, you've done a couple hundred contracts, you get to the point where you start to feel both sides of the table as you're writing the contract. Um, but it, that's important. It, do, both feel, do both parties feel valued in the relationship? Uh, is your success accretive to this company's success? Um, and, and so on. So I, I think it, it, it really, a lot of people can manufacture how well they can manufacture this debatable at times. How strong is their QMS? Again, we're talking about subjectivity. Remove that from it and get to an objective base. Um, and ultimately, how well, how will you work together? Do you feel valued? Those are the important things that, that, that lead you into a, a strong relationship, in my opinion. Um, and you may go through cycles where they, you feel that way, and then one quarter you feel that way, the next quarter you don't. Um, making sure you've got someone there that you can work with and, and, and has that uh, point of escalation. And I think most importantly, bring up escalation. That's something that, that Jable thrives on is escalation. We don't see it as a negative thing. If anything, escalation is often used in order to help us identify areas of weakness that need more support. Um, so really understanding when you're in that relationship, what's your escalation strategy? And does that, does your partner understand that, that if I don't hear from you for a day, I'm going up a level. If I don't hear from another day, I'm going up a level. 
Um, and, and having that open, uh, open and honest relationship is extremely important for both parties to feel valued, in my opinion. And again, it goes both ways. So if you're, if I'm, if I'm going to escalate it inside of a customer, the customer has got to be able to escalate inside of me. How do we have that, that hierarchy broken down and, and, and how do we lay that out so that both parties feel, feel that they have at any time the opportunity to move up the board and, and, uh, and get their, their, uh, questions answered. Awesome. Um, one uh, additional question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it word for word and then hopefully it makes sense here. Um, how much should marketability come into play when there are often multiple departments involved in purchase decisions? For example, a new device makes an ER nurse's task faster and safer for both patients and nurses yet price is 30% higher. Purchasing in bulk, now what? Great, so this goes back to what we talk about, the objective nature of marketing. What are you really gaining? Um, what is it that if you're 30% if you're more expensive, what are you gaining by using that device? And if there is a speed element of it and a workflow. So, you know, for instance, we, we, we've dealt with pharmaceutical concepts in the past where a pharmacy if anyone's ever been to a CVS, uh, I've stay, I've, I, during this particular review, stood and watched for three hours a pharmacy. And you talk about, they, they never stop moving. There's a reason there's no chairs in there. I mean, they are always on the move. Imagine making one change to that process and, and seeing how it affects their whole workflow or telling them they have to use this instead of that. Um, you have to really get down to almost a, a timing and understanding of, of what is this going to do from uh, uh, the reduce somewhere, say if you're if you're paying 30% more in one area, where are you going to save 30 or 35% somewhere else? Um, and if that means, for instance, uh, if you're talking about a nurse where this makes the nurse's job easier, well, if it makes their job easier, does it equate to dollars saved? Well, in a way, it does because happy nurses are nurses that are going to stay employed. So now you're going to reduce your turnover. But having that objective data in order to show that is is often tough to gather. But it can be gathered, um, and, and I think over time you you can, if you dig in and, and look for that information, you'll find it and be able to leverage it. Um, but coming right out of the gates with a device that you don't have that background, it's going to be a tough it's going to be a tough go. Um, so then that's where marketing comes in, where perhaps marketing can say, look, you're going to use this device over the course of four years, and over the course of four years, the expectation is going to cost you a little bit more, but Here's how it makes everybody's life easier and happier. And, and from that, it's going to achieve a cost savings long term, maybe a subjective cost savings, which yeah. if you've gathered so far, I'm a big fan of objectivity, not subjectivity. But I think in marketing, there's a lot of subjectivity that pops up and, and being able to measure that can be a challenge, but it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I you know, when I looked at this question, I, I love it. Um, we're actually doing a a webinar and partner with uh, Greenlight Guru on on how to get access to uh, hospital decision or healthcare decision makers, right? Um, and and I like that they used um, nurses and patients. Um, the patients piece, I don't, I don't know too many med tech products that don't aren't are you know main mission isn't to improve patients' lives in some way. Um, but, but the piece about nurses, I'd like to call this out just as well, is um, I'm sure everyone at this point understands there's a nursing shortage. Um, and so within hospitals, probably 10, 15 years ago, you had to have a physician who said, yeah, I want this product in our hospital tomorrow. Um, now that's not the case. Clinicians as a whole have, have, have a voice in terms of they can be your champion within the healthcare system, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, physician assistants, nurses, um, ultrasound techs, right? Like you name it, um, because there are those shortages, that is on hospitals' minds. So, um, you know, I, 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 I like that they asked this question because you, you can use that as a lever to, to get into some of these hospitals. Um, and you will need to collect some of that data, you know, post that and, and, and have that. But, but anyways, I thought it was a great question. Um, Jim, I really appreciate you uh, hopping on and um, just having a chat about this uh, with me. Uh, I, I like the format we did here, but, but I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, for those who 
are, are, are still on. Um, the contact information for Galen is on the screen there. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, we should have our May webinar uh, up, and, uh, up and, and, and launched here in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. Um, and thanks everyone so much for joining, and thank you, Jim. Thanks, Dwayne. Really appreciate it. This was fun. Thank you.